Good morning. This is our adult Sunday school lesson for Sunday, September 6th for Mount Vernon Baptist Church. We began a new study journey today and the title of our lesson today is The Beginning of Creation. It's taken from Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 25. And our application to begin this study is the student will discuss that the beginning of faith is accepting that God created all things. Now, in terms of prayer requests this Sunday, we need to be continually much in prayer, strong in prayer for those who are struggling with the virus. We also need to make absolutely sure that God hears our prayers of faithfulness and we do not waver. We must continue to pray even when the situation seems more difficult than it was last week. Those that we know and love are being attacked by the virus and those that we know and love are battling the virus and it is indeed a terrible situation with the pandemic. But our prayers must be constant, they must be uplifting, and the Lord must know that our hearts are much in prayer for this. Now, <clears throat> our verses today are the first 25 verses of chapter 1. And the Bible reads this way with scripture that is actually very familiar to us all. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and he called the evening and the morning he said were the second day and God said let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so God said let the waters under the heaven be gathered and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas and God saw that it was good God said let the earth bring forth grass an herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly. And after their kind, and every winged fowl <clears throat> after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. May the Lord's word be blessed among us 
for our understanding. Now, as we take up this new study journey, it makes sense to make sure that we walk this study path in truth. The truth can be unfulfilled if we do not approach Genesis to be the start of something new between the Creator and those whom He created for Himself. Contrary to many spiritual journals and commentaries, the biblical narrative does not tell of our journey toward God. Rather, it is the other way around. We must understand this as we study this truth. The right approach is not, what questions do I have to ask of the Bible? The right approach is, what question does the Bible have to ask of me? God did not wait for Adam to start looking for him after he fell into sin. It is God who comes looking with the question of, Adam, where are you? Which are the first words spoken to a fallen humanity. God will later say to Job in that very important lesson, Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Job 38, 3. Through his prophet Jeremiah, God says, I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. We have no scriptures that teach us that Moses was looking for Jehovah in the Midian desert while he kept the flock of Jethro. But God called Moses by name to himself from the burning bush. Exodus 3, 2. God told Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 that he had already chosen David to rule Israel while David was still a lad in his father's sheephold. Do we see the truth here that is evident for us? What the Bible asks is that we read it in faith, remembering that faith is not a human achievement, but is the gift of God. We should gird ourselves for the questions that will be coming to us from the Lord and prepare ourselves for the receiving of the gift that he has arranged for each of us who will come to believe. Just as our study in Revelation showed us the plan of God for the divine end of all human things, the book of Genesis will show us the divine beginning, and the 64 books in between will constantly ask us the question that Jesus posed in John 16, 31. Do ye now believe? There are two underlying themes of the first book of the Bible. The first is that to begin a new life of faith, one must accept that there is a creator and that he is in his infinite wisdom capable and producing all things. That creation was marked by the fact that this creation was not done from that which previously existed, but rather simply done by the word of God speaking it into existence. This means that the creation was done ex nihilo, meaning from nothing. God spoke it, and it was so. <clears throat> the second theme is the fall of mankind into sin. Mankind proved to be inadequate in himself to overcome sin, and therefore he became dead spiritually before God. Sin pre-existed man, and when mankind was first exposed to it, she and he fell before it by willingly choosing it, contrary to the command of God. This is a book of beginnings whose author is ultimately the Lord, but spoken through his scribe, Moses. This chosen one wrote the first five books of our Bible, which came to be known as the Torah, or the law. Jesus spoke this truth in Luke 24, 44, teaching that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, the prophets, and Psalms, and that they were all concerning him. It is commonly thought that the book was penned down approximately 1450 B.C., and the book covers human time of creation until about 1600 B.C. There are several areas that we will focus our study journey upon as we go forward. In chapters 1 and 2, we will see the beginning of the universe and man. In chapter 3, we will see the fall of man and the Redeemer. In verses <clears throat> 4 and 5 throughout those two chapters, 
children appear and society is developed and the line of faith is given. Six through nine will give us the flood and everything pertaining to it and why it happened and what happened after. 10 and 11 began to see nations to be formed. 12 through 25, we will see the life of Abraham. 21 through 37, we will see the life of Isaac. 25 through 50, we will see the life of Jacob. And 37 through 50, we will see the life of Joseph. We quickly note that Genesis says more about the life of Joseph than it does about creation itself. We need to keep that fact in mind when we get there. There's a reason for that. Our first three words, in the beginning, are taught in Genesis 1, but they're also taught again, both in the Gospel of John and in Paul's writing to the Colossians. John 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and that the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things that were created were made by the Word, meaning our Lord and Messiah, Jesus. Colossians 1.18 teaches that Jesus, who is the beginning, assures that believers not overlook the importance of all three members of the Trinity working in creation. Genesis 1-2 teaches us that the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. The Hebrew word used in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, is Elohim, which is the plural form of the Hebrew word for God, and it means there is more than one here working. Even at the foundation of the world, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all involved. Later in Deuteronomy 6.4, Moses will teach us how to understand that by telling us that the Lord our God is one Lord. But even from the first day, God has manifested himself to us in three persons. Before we begin our study of creation verses by day, we should consider a much deeper look at verse 2. Here we are told that the earth was without form and was void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Hebrew word is tohu, T-O-H-U, and it's used here to mean unformed and empty. Also, we must note that each creation day that we will see was described as the evening and the morning. Each day of God's work in creation began in darkness, and each ended in light. Here is the ancient wording to begin our understanding of salvation that will be fully explained in our New Testament much later. John 3.19 will later teach us that sinful man loved darkness more than light. 1 Peter 2.9 will further teach us that when we are chosen of God, we are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. From this moment in Genesis onward until today, Jewish people mark the end of each day <clears throat> and say that the new day begins at 6 p.m. and it goes from 6 p.m. this day to 6 p.m. the next. And now we are given a description of each day of creation by God so that we may see the order and the progress of the beginning of all things. The first day, verses 3 through 5. This day involves the creation of light and the separation of light from darkness. 1 John 1, 5 teaches that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The Lord used this separation to mark each day. We note again that God commanded light to appear. This was not the light from the sun or the moon, as these were not yet created. This light was from God himself. It was not from some creative body or some body that reflected light, such as our moon has always done. The second day in verses 6 through 8, on this day, God created the firmament. The Hebrew word rakia, R-A-Q-I-A, means to stretch forth and make new. The land was separated from the deep of water, and above the firmament was made what we call sky, which is the first of three heavens. When God called it heaven, he is indicating his own control over it. All three heavens are owned and controlled by him. The first is our sky. The second is the area above it we call space, the place of stars and planets, 
And the third is the last heaven above that where God himself resides. On the third day in verses 9 through 13, God gathered the firmament into a landmass and made it dry, separating water from water. He named the land earth and the water seas. Now God was preparing the world for the existence of life. Plants and trees were spoken into existence, and they were commanded to reproduce within their own kind. In both verses 10 and 12, God said that it was good. The fourth day, verses 14 through 19, on this day God created the stars, the sun, and the moon. He gave two reasons for this portion of creation, a fact that many of us at times seem to overlook. The first reason for these things to glow in our sky was for signs to mankind from him. That will come later. And for the second reason was for the seasons to mark the days and years throughout the light of the days. Now time as we know it was here and will remain until New Jerusalem where there will be no sun. Again, God said it was good. The fifth day, verses 20 through 33. On this day, God created the life of the seas and the fowls of the air. Verse 21 again commands that they are to reproduce only after their kind. This command provides our understanding that all creatures were made to reproduce only themselves and not to mingle with other species to try to refine what God has created. Just like the plants and the trees, animal life is to reproduce only themselves. Here is the strong command to assure us that we as mankind did not evolve from some lesser creature or that man was not a result of some interbreeding of species. God made all life and command was clear as strong as to reproduction. There are currently almost 34,000 types of fish in the oceans and fresh waters. And even though there are many types, all fish are still fish, just as God commanded. Verse 21 teaches us that God saw it and said it was good. The sixth day, verses 24 through 25. Now on the last day of creation, God created the animal life that will live on the land. He divided this creation into three areas, cattle, creeping things, and beasts of the earth. This division implies size, small, medium, and large. As with vegetation and life in the sea and fowls, all of these creatures are to reproduce only within their own kind. Man also was created on the sixth day, but we'll examine that portion of creation in our next lesson. What have we learned from the six days and how God worked and commanded? What God created was an ideal habitat for mankind. Everything that was needful for man was created to be in place for the crown of his creation on earth, which is man. Genesis 2, 5 teaches us that originally the earth and all plants were not watered by rain, but by a vapor that rose within the uplifted waters as they were separated. This vapor tent acted as a worldwide greenhouse and a warm and pleasant climate with a perfect blending of temperature and moisture to make a fertile home for providing food for man and the beasts of the earth. Our world was prepared to supply all of the needs to sustain life and to arrange constant nourishment for mankind to come. All was made right awaiting the last creation. Next week we will use our study journey to visit the creation of man and what God teaches us about that last process of creation. Now, to prepare our hearts and minds for that lesson, we must conclude today with the view of what man was when he was first created in that form and then what he became. Man was far different in his created form before the fall. He was made in the image and the likeness of God. We must never forget this. He was placed by God into a garden of perfection. He was provided a helpmate and given dominion over the lower levels of created beings. He was blessed by God and commanded to be fruitful and multiply and was the only creation that God deemed to be very good. 
Adam had all that his heart could possibly desire. Behind him, he had no history of sinful heredity. Within him was no wicked or deceitful heart. Upon him were no marks of corruption, and nowhere around him were there any marks of death. With Eve by his side, these first parents in fellowship with their maker were purely happy and content. We will see in 2.25 that they both lived naked and they were not ashamed. God was faithful to warn man <clears throat> that with only one command he must avoid the forbidden tree. But Eve was beguiled by the serpent, ate of the tree that was forbidden, and gave the fruit to Adam, and he ate as well. Sin had arrived. God had promised death would follow, and it did. They died spiritually as soon as they enjoyed the forbidden fruit. Physical death is the separation of the spirit from the body. Ecclesiastes 12.7 is our teaching. Spiritual death is the separation of the spirit from God. In that moment of the fall, while the juice of the forbidden fruit was still moist on the lips of Adam and Eve, Jesus turned from his throne in eternity and began the journey toward earth. We will study more about his pathway to reconcile man's sin in chapter 3. Let us not forget this fact because it was the sin of the woman and man that caused the curse to be poured out on the world. Ever since the Garden of Eden and the fall, creation itself has groaned for redemption. Romans 8.22 Next week we will discover the glorious sixth day in which God's final creation work brought mankind to life. I hope to see you there.